Wonderful. Um, thank you for these nice introductory words. And uh, I'm very honored to be able to give you this uh, opening lecture of the conference. So what I would like to do is to speak for you about AI and the ways in which it disrupts the ethical framework, the ethical concepts, the ways in which we do ethics. Disruption may sound like a very negative word, but I actually do not see it as something very negative. I see it as part of an evolution in which we have always been as human beings. Technologies have always helped to shape what it means to be human, and therefore have always urged us to rethink the concepts with which we can do ethics in the first place. So that's what I hope to address. And I think the specific thing for artificial intelligence is that it really starts to affect the way in which we think. It starts to affect our, our mind, you could say. And that's actually also the key of what we are doing at UNESCO. UNESCO is, of course, uh, the institution that deals with science, culture, education, communication. It's all elements of the mind. And AI is, for good reasons, of course, a central topic of attention there because the future of the mind, as it were, is at stake. Um, let me first give you a broad introduction and then uh, indicate which three steps I would like to, to, to make in my talk. Many people see artificial intelligence as part of the fourth industrial revolution, as you say. And so after the, four, uh, after the first one, the mechanization, we, we got a, a second one. The factories came into being, assembly lines, mass production. And then we had the third one, automation. The computer was invented which took us to the fourth industrial revolution that we are in now and the age of what people call cyber physical systems, which means basically that the computer becomes physical. Information technology is not only about avatars on a screen in a virtual world or something, but the internet becomes an internet of things. AI is embodied in a robot in the material world in which we live. In Japan, many people even now uh, speak about the fifth type of society emerging from the fourth industrial revolution with a slightly different organization of history and actually also with quite some explicit, uh, well, maybe deterministic uh, tones, which I do not entirely share. The framework is then that we have moved from several types of societies to another one because of a technology that was invented. We have been hunter gatherers, but the plow enabled us to stay on one place, to live on one place, because we could re-fertilize the soil, bringing us to an agrarian society. Then the steam engine took us to the industrial, um, the computer to the information society, and now AI, the fourth revolution, takes us to the digital society. And in this digital society, we need new ways to do ethics. Artificial intelligence challenges how we do ethics. And the challenge for many people is actually seen in terms of a, well, a fear of some kind of for replacement, yeah, where artificial intelligence starts to do things that until now only humans could do, um, making decisions, giving interpretations of the world. And a lot of AI ethics frameworks are all about, well, taking control over AI. Now you must have seen them, typically the same uh, key words are in all the ethical frameworks. Uh, algorithms need to be explainable uh, so that we humans can actually take responsibility for the decisions that we make on the basis of an advice that AI gives. Algorithms need to be somehow transparent so that we understand how they do their work. And of course, the impact needs to be fair somehow. What I would like to do in this talk is to well, delve a little bit deeper and to understand the specific interactions we have with AI and how actually we as moral beings are at stake there. So what I want to do is first to take you through uh, ideas about human technology relations. I will um, just introduce you to a specific uh, style of doing philosophy of human tech relations, where it's all about mediation, where technologies become mediators between human beings and the world. As a second step, I will then try to analyze with you how artificial intelligence mediates our intentionalities, our intentions to act, but also our intentional relations with the world, to say it with a phenomenological word, the way in which we are directed, the way in which we understand, the way in which we interpret the world around us. And that will then take us thirdly to the question of how to do ethics. And we will see that AI quite deeply, uh, well, uh, intervenes in how, how we do ethics. Uh, which also gives a new role to ethical uh, thinking. It's all about rethinking the concepts with which we can do ethics in the first place at an abstract level, but also in practice, it's about getting in touch with the well specific details of technologies or AI systems that play a role in practices of education, of healthcare, etc. Let's first start with that idea of human technology relations. So 
often uh, people make quite a sharp distinction between humans and devices. Hey, where humans are uh, in the realm of the subjects uh, with intentions and freedom. Humans can be held accountable for what they do. Technologies are in the realm of the objects. They're that mute, silent. They're, they're instruments in the hands of humans, so to say. And so the subjects and the objects, and that's how we organize the world. Technologies are then easily linked, of course, in the world of the objects. Whereas in reality, we do not that much interact with technologies as an object opposed to ourselves, as an element of the world. Actually, typically, technologies connect us to the world. They help to shape how we perceive the world, how we understand the world, how we behave in that world. Um, and that's interesting, I think, because if you take that thought seriously, then we need a different framework, a different way to understand the nature of human technology interactions, human technology relations. In philosophical anthropology, this has always been quite a big theme, actually. I really like this picture when I saw it when the, uh, the iPhone, uh, the new model, <laughs> was uh, shown in 2017, where uh, they made a comparison between the hand axe and the iPhone. Um, and I like it so much because it, it shows actually quite well how in philosophical anthropology, people have well, tried to understand how technologies play a role in um, human life. Here the framework is that uh, in some theories, um, technology needs to be seen as the specific thing that distinguishes human beings from other animals. And that's often reduced, in fact, to the, to, to the fact that we have hands. Uh, French anthropology, Le Roi Gourand, for instance, has this interesting uh, theory of uh, the fact that humans are distinguished uh, by the fact that they started to walk on, on, on two legs rather than on four, which gave the front legs as arms, which gave them hands. An animal has to operate objects with their mouth, but humans can operate things with their hands. And that actually is a stimulus for the development of our brains, our minds, our language, for instance. It helps if you can explain to other people what you can do with objects. Or memory, it helps if you can remember what you can do with objects. Or creativity, and you can design objects, not just use things that you find. So the hand is then often seen as the source of, well, the specific way in which we are humans. And because we have hands, we have developed an interaction with technologies. Technologies uh, form, therefore, the, the niche in which our evolution could take shape, you could say. And that's maybe an interesting conclusion, because that results in an approach to the human beings where humans are not animals with something extra, with language or with reason or something. Humans are actually animals in which something is missing, <laughs> which we need to compensate for with technology. We don't have a very thick fur, so we need to make fire when it's cold outside. We don't have very strong jaws, yeah, so we need to use equipment to, uh, to eat our food, etc. Technologies are then part of what it means to be human. It's really interesting, the fear that we often have for technology, if we look into the future, that AI might take over, and the biggest risk, uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, Gates, etc., have warned us for the risk of AI. People are afraid. But if we look back, we try to understand what kind of humans lived before us by looking at their technologies. So that framework can help. And that, I think, is a way to understand AI as well. AI stands in the tradition, I think, of technologies that have helped to shape how our minds function, how we think. In a tradition that started maybe with writing, when well, the interesting thing, as you might all know, is that, of course, the oldest text that we have uh, the, the were texts in the time that people started to write things down. Plato was among them in the Western tradition, and he was really afraid of writing because he feared that our memories would actually go down. And that uh, for some reason, uh, of course, uh, we would lose the capacity to, to memorize uh, longer stories. And of course, in a sense, that has happened, <laughs> but we have externalized our memories in a way that we can now actually use books, bookshelves, uh, written text as somehow, well, being an externalization of our memory. The printing press, maybe, is another step in that whole development. The scientific revolution could never have taken place without the press. Knowledge was locked up in monasteries, and now suddenly there was a democratization of knowledge. Knowledge could travel all, all over the world. So in that sense, AI is just another step a new technical infrastructure for the mind. Minds are not only uh, human, minds are always connected to an environment and AI helps us to make sense of the world. And then of course the ethics is about how to deal with that in a responsible way. But the ethics is also about how to find the right concepts to understand what is actually at stake. So in um, uh, this uh, theory of mediation, 
the story is then actually quite simple. We often make this um, distinction between humans and world, subject and object. And in post phenomenology, uh, technology becomes actually not part of the world, but part of the kind of relation between humans and the world. Technology is the medium in which the relations between humans and their environment take shape. The medium that also helps to shape that kind of interaction. It helps to shape how humans are in their world by, well, mediating our actions, our behavior, practices on a societal level, how we do education, how we do healthcare, and also perception and interpretation. It mediates how the world is there for us, how we perceive the world, how we understand the world. A very basic framework, which can help to make sense of how technologies organize the interaction between humans and their environment. Don Eide, the American thinker who introduced this way of thinking, even made quite a detailed uh, kind of yeah, you say analysis of the structure of all these various human technology world relations. And so in this scheme, he moves from embodiment relations to hermeneutic relations, to alternative relations, to background relations, where technologies move ever further away from the human. In embodiment, the human and the technology well, form some kind of a unity, which is directed at the world. In a hermeneutic relation, technology forms a unity with the world. And humans are directed at a representation <coughs> that a thermometer, for instance, gives off of the world. In an alternative relation, you interact with a technology and the world is not that important. And in a background relation, technologies are a context. You don't experience them directly, but still by being a context, they help to shape how you experience the world. So that's, I mean, this is work from the 1980s and 1990s. The digital revolution forces us to expand that framework. This is all still built on an idea of technologies that we use, that we can actually operate. There's still a bit of subject object thinking behind it, as it were. We as intentional subjects use a technological object. David Bowie here behind the first Apple Macintosh. Use has become some kind of an obsolete concept if we think about AI, if you think about the digital technologies that we have around us now. Rather, immersion is a good way to understand it. We are immersed in a world where technologies help to shape how we uh, behave. Technologies perceive us, sensors in buildings, smart hospitals, smart schools, smart homes, the sensors detect human beings. And actually, then, well, we are also seduced to change our behavior by hints that we get from our environment. And the Internet of Things is maybe the most important aspect of this, actually a theme that uh, Comest is also working on now. And this afternoon, we will uh, show a new study that we wrote on, uh, on IoT. Opportunistic IoT becomes ever more important. Opportunistic IoT meaning uh, we wear sensors with us. Our mobile phone is full of sensors that you can also use for purposes that they were not designed for. Uh, in the field of, well, uh, the, the fight against the virus, you must have it as well in South Africa. Many people here in the Netherlands have an app on their phone that can detect if you have been closer than one and a half meter for longer than 15 minutes to somebody else using the Bluetooth radio as a proximity detector. Immersion is a better word maybe than use, or fusion, the brain stimulation, an implant in the brain, which en enables us to, to, to tweak, as it were, the functioning of the brain, which is a dazzling consequence from an anthropological point of view. The brain is the organ that gives us freedom, and now we develop a technological well, freedom towards that freedom, a meta-freedom or something. Augmentation, a second layer of information, Google Glass, HoloLens adds a layer of information to the world. We can go on and interaction. And now we approach the field of AI, interacting with a robot, really interacting. A robot being able to read our emotions, to, to read how we feel, how we think, and actually also being able to express emotions to, well, foster a new kind of interaction with a technology being present at the distance, as we are doing now, as we have learned to do, uh, as we had to <laughs> over the past uh, year or so, and where we have this second body, and sometimes it's actually a robotic body, I will say more about that later, that enables us to be somewhere else, as it were. And then maybe uh, for AI, the key word might be cooperation. Um, interacting with the technology, and I will say much more about it in, uh, in a few minutes, uh, where, for instance, if a medical doctor tries to understand what's uh, uh, the problem with a patient. And the doctor looks at the patients, the, the, the AI system looks at the patient, but the AI system also needs to look at the doctor to see what the doctor understands. It's kind of a triangular interaction between AI and the patient, and we need to understand what is happening there. So if you continue the path of Don Idy with all these 
uh, and arrows and dashes, and you would get a, a list like this. I will not go into all the details, but it shows that there are a lot of intentionality structures at stake, you could say, when new technological configurations start to emerge in the world. If you, for instance, focus on telepresence, I will say also more about that later, and there's always a human being interacting with some kind of a control unit operating a technology on a distance <laughs> that has an interaction with the world for you. A drone, and you operate it through a controller, the drone sees the world, acts in the world, where there's actually three complicated steps of intentionality. You have to develop an intentional interaction with the controller. You plus the controller have an interaction with the drone plus the world. And the drone has a specific way of being somehow related to the world. And then all those intentional elements, um, well, the interaction between humans and the world takes shape in new ways. It's important, I think, to see that um, this interaction is not uh, static, but dynamic. Uh, we've done uh, quite some work on this theory of mediation over the past years. Olya Kudina uh, has been working uh, in the context of this uh, uh, field on the model of uh, what she has come to call the hermeneutic lemniscate. Uh, which is an expansion of the idea of the hermeneutic circle, a concept from hermeneutics, basically saying that in any act of interpretation, there is a circular relation between the interpreter and the interpreted. If you interpret something, that something becomes also a context for you, which helps to shape you as a specific interpreter of the world. Now, technologies typically play a role there. Uh, with an example of Don Aidi, the invention of the telescope, um, well, helped uh, somebody like Galileo to interpret the moon in a totally different way. He saw spots on the moon, and first he thought it was about uh, aberrations in the lens. So he polished the lens more and more and more, because in the cosmology of those days, the moon had to be a perfectly round ball. But then the better the lenses got, the more he saw that actually the moon was not a perfectly round ball. There were craters on the moon, there were mountains on the moon. So he had to appropriate the technology in a specific way. And that's what you see in this first line. And the technology uh, let the moon be there in a very specific way for him. It took a new interpretation, which gave the technology a new role in doing astronomy, which also reconfigured the human as a specific observer, you could say. Well, this theory of mediation can also help us to understand AI. And I think it's really important to see that there are several elements of the human world relation that are always mediated by technologies. And for instance, we have done quite a lot of work on um, scientific mediation, you could say, the mediation of knowledge. How do technologies mediate scientific knowledge? And that sounds maybe like an absurd or maybe even relativistic claim, which it is absolutely not. The whole idea is that in order to do science, you need to enter into a relation with the phenomena that you study. And the relations that you are in are always mediated by a technology. If you ask a neuropsychologist nowadays why teenagers can't take that much forms of responsibility for their behavior, you typically get a, a picture of an fMRI scan showing the part of the brain where rational decision making uh, is located, showing that actually at a specific age that is, well, less organized or it works differently than for uh, other people. So in order to make that claim, you have to have a very specific reading of the brain through fMRI imaging, which is totally different than if we would only have an EEG, where you get just uh, graphs of the signals of the electricity in the, in, in the brain, as it were. And looking back, you could even say that Freud had a technical infrastructure with a sofa, a chair behind it, so that the patient could not see him, let the unconscious or the subconscious thoughts flow freely and get in touch with, uh, well, what is... Uh, the cause of your behavior. And, and Freud, of course, also had an explanation why teenagers can take responsibility that well. It was that they need to free themselves from their mothers, uh, maybe also their fathers, at least the conscience that is, uh, well, implanted in them. And in, in order to make yourself free from that, you have to behave irresponsibly to discover by yourself where the boundaries are. Totally different story, different technical infrastructure. Technologies organize how we do science, therefore how we understand the world. And with a continental word, I, I, I like to mix analytic and continental traditions. It's uh, well, a hermeneutic structure, a mediated hermeneutics that is at stake in scientific work. Most importantly, in ethics, this is true as well. And that makes it really complicated. Uh, one of the examples that I often give of this is um, value dynamism. The dynamic nature of values, technologies mediate what values mean for us. And that's just one example of this disruptive nature of 
new technologies. Um, the mediation of values, for instance, is visible in this example, uh, which is about anesthesia. Um, it's interesting, if you read early analysis of anesthesia, people really had issues with it. People really were, um, well, uh, afraid of using anesthesia, painkilling during surgery. And looking back, you can also really understand that. I mean, the main argument was actually that it has a signal function that we feel pain when we open the body. There is something like an integrity of the body. If you open the body, you do something that's not supposed to happen. Hey, of course, you can get ill of it, you can die of it. And if you suppress that signal, then you actually go against human dignity. This, it was experienced as disrespectful to give anesthesia during surgery. Of course, that has changed totally. And by now, uh, the opposite is, 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 is true, you could say. It's totally disrespectful if you would operate on somebody without anesthesia. So this value of human dignity, dignified suffering, respectful ways of dealing with patients has changed through technologies. And this makes the ethics of technology super complicated because it means that we do not only need to anticipate the future implications of a technology when we are designing it to raise the right ethical questions, but we might also need to anticipate the future ethical frameworks from which they might be evaluated in the future. It might sound somehow relativistic, but at the same time, if you look back, I think we have also, oh, I think we should recognize that we believe that in some cases, uh, the ethical frameworks we have now, we would rather have them than the framework from the past. Yeah, where actually, of course, there were a lot of inequalities in societies uh, between uh, uh, the genders, uh, between uh, ethnicities, and that we actually uh, want to get rid of. Um, so ethics is dynamic and technology is a driver of this dynamics. Now, how to take that into uh, the mediation uh, by artificial intelligence? Let me see how I am in time. Still, so, okay, I think halfway. Um, AI has a specific relation to uh, human intentionalities. And I think that is what we should in investigate. And I think the most important thing is that we should move a bit beyond the framework of alterity and beyond the framework that AI should be seen as another, as a replacement of the human. And if you look at roboethics, uh, some forms of AI ethics, and this alterity, this otherness is often uh, seen as a point of reference. And we should avoid, for instance, that AI does not explain that it is actually not a human eh? or that robots take over human roles, that they take our jobs or something. Um, and so the comparison between humans and robots, where robots or AI systems are seen as a danger to humans, happens a lot. What I want to do is actually to show that this is yet another manifestation of the same story that we've always told about technologies. And when the steam engine was invented, it was also seen as another. And there were also Luddites trying to destroy the machines because they would take their jobs, etc. And over the course of history, we have learned to appropriate these technologies and to integrate them into our societies. And they have become mediators. They have come to reorganize labor. And actually, they have done that quite invasively. And in that sense, I think Marxism should be seen as some kind of a footnote to the steam engine. And it was a radical analysis of what the steam engine would do to our society, yeah? requiring factory owners to have big loans. Capital comes into being. You need to produce much more than for your local environment because you need to pay back the bank, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that same line of thinking is needed for AI. Encountering AI systems has many forms, and I will discuss three of them. Interaction with AI systems, cooperating with AI systems, and the re-embodiment uh, uh, through uh, forms of telepresence, where AI systems typically also play a role in how we can present, be present at a distance. And I will analyze, again, the intentional structure of these human AI relations and what I will do. So let's start with that idea of interaction and the alterity frame, but that may be expanded in a specific way. And so uh, if you read um, popular stories or look at documentaries about AI systems, uh, typically AI systems and robots. And so um, this is uh, maybe one of the examples that is quite famous in the Netherlands, a, um, a company robot, a robot that helps to keep elderly people company. And there is actually quite an, 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 well, a beautiful documentary about it, maybe you've seen it, which reveals how that works and also how people get attached to the robots, which also conveys a message of worry. Yes? Should we do this? Aren't we mocking the elderly people? Aren't we making them feel attached to robots that actually cannot feel attachment? 
So this is um, maybe, um, well, a very important frame that is active in our society. So let, let's try to analyze the intentionality structure in that interaction. I think uh, the idea of alterity, uh, us and the other, needs to be rethought in terms of a form of reciprocity, because that's typically what is different uh, than uh, the alterity relation in Don Idy's work, where basically uh, getting money from an ATM is quite a functional interaction between the human and the technology. So there is a reciprocity in the sense that there is a mutual intentionality, a reciprocal uh, intentionality. Humans are related to the artificial agent, but the artificial agent is also relating to the human. Actually, we need to design into the agent, into the robot, what kind of interaction, what kind of interpretation is there? And of course, that raises the question, reciprocity, is that a word that we can even use if it's about uh, humans and AI systems? Because it requires a form of intentionality of the system. Can it be such a thing as AI intentionality? Or are we, uh, well, entering into the slippery slope of strong AI? And of course, that is not at all uh, what I want to claim. I want to uh, deepen this out maybe by a little sidestep to Belloponti's work on uh, uh, interpersonal relations, on the chiasm, where he instantly shows that interpersonal relations typically have the character of a cross, you could say, not as a, as a line, as uh, you would do in phenomenology, a human, human, uh, post phenomenology, human technology, human. It is a cross. Because in any interaction, we are there as a perceiver and as the one being perceived, as an experiencer and the one being experienced. And with quotes like, he himself, he, in this case, who looks must not be foreign to the world he looks at. Well, this means that um, actually this cross that, that we are in is also predetermined by what he calls the flesh. We are made of the same substance as the stuff, literally, that we see. We are material beings, and that um, the fact that that is the case makes it possible for us to see uh, material things and to experience other beings, other human beings, also as material. And with the example of the hand, and you can touch your own hand, where you're both a subject and an object for yourself. And my hand, while it's felt from within, is also accessible from without, itself being tangible for my other hand. And he says, as soon as I see, it's necessary that the vision be doubled with a complementary vision, myself seen from without such as another would see me, installed in the midst of the visible, occupied and considering it from a certain spot. So there is this chiasmic uh, interaction between uh, humans in the world. And the question is, what kind of chiasm do we have with a robot? And so if there is that cross of perceiver and perceived, if there is not a line that is mediated, but a cross, the interesting thing is, what does technology then exactly do in that cross? Now you could say, well, the way in which to analyze this is to see that technologies mediate that very chiasm and the condition of the flesh becomes now techno flesh. And so there's not a dyadic relation, but a chiasmatic relation or some kind of chiasmic relation. I'm not sure how you should say this in English, um, where there's a mediation actually of touch and being touched, where, where the self and the other are re constituted, what a self, what an other means. And that maybe is also ethically disruptive. Um, so the question is not, can there be AI intentionality eh, in a sense of, um, can it form intentions? It's more, uh, can there be this intentional directedness at the world? And that can be the case as Don Idy has so nicely explained. Of course, technologies have a specific way of perceiving, of actually, well, um, picking up specific signals. But from this post phenomenological point of view, the question is not does AI have intentions, but more how does intentionality of human beings come about in interaction with AI systems? So ultimately, the interaction with AI systems based on that uh, techno flash is about mediated intentionality, where technologies mediate the interpretive frameworks that we have to make sense of the world, including the moral framework. For a robot, you can quite interestingly see that. And this is a picture that we often show if we explain uh, the work that we are doing in the Netherlands with a big team of people where we are working for 10 years on socially disruptive um, technologies. Cindy is actually in the audience. I saw Cindy Friedman, who was just appointed as a PhD student in this uh, field. Uh, but um, we try to think through the idea that in Saudi Arabia, uh, personhood was given to Sophia, a humanoid robot. But as soon as you do that, as soon as you start to interfere with, uh, well, the boundary between humans and technologies in terms of personhood, then you actually need to rethink all the central ethical concepts. Persons have, have agency. 
but does a robot have agency? Does an AI system have agency? What does agency mean then? Does it mean that you have um, intentionality, that you have intentions? Well, in a, in a sense, a robot can intend to act. Or does it mean that it has freedom? Well, in a sense that not everything that an AI system does can be reduced to what the designer put into it. it algorithms learn in interaction with their environment. And therefore, you cannot always hold the designer accountable for what the system is doing. Just like raising a child. At some point, you're not going to blame the parents for the behavior of the child. Agency comes with responsibility. So should we attribute responsibility to to AI systems, to, to robots. Of course, they have some form of responsibility. They help us to make decisions, but how to conceptualize that form of responsibility then? Because uh, can we still use the human concepts of responsibility in this context? Or maybe even stronger, human rights. Persons have rights. So if we blur the boundary between a person and a robot, should a robot have rights? It sounds like a totally absurd idea, but the more you think about it, the, com the more complicated it gets. I've been having some uh, interesting interactions with a Japanese professor in robotics, Professor um, sorry, Asada, <laughs> and uh, he's doing super interesting work in terms of AI, where he tries to let AI systems learn to orient themselves in the world, not by means of concepts, but by means of just interactions with the world that feel good or that don't feel good, with pleasure and pain, you could say. He tries to mimic the development of a baby, and then, of course, a robot that can feel pain, whatever that may be, <laughs> immediately raises the question, OK, if we design a robot to feel pain, are we then responsible for that? And how can we deal with that in a responsible way? Should we put limits to that? Are there rights of robots that needs to be somehow respected? Well, persons are element of our democracy. Together, we form a people. We want to organize our society in a democratic way where all voices are heard. Do we also need to hear the voices of the AI systems then. And if at some point AI systems become so independent, we get so used to interacting with them that maybe, maybe switching them off would feel like murder. <laughs> what will that do to our democracy? Well, a lot of food for thought, I think, here to see how we need to reconfigure the frameworks in ethics, all based on that new interaction we have with robots, where the chiasm takes a different shape. The second one is cooperation. I already introduced that um, model a little bit before, uh, speaking about uh, medical doctors uh, and uh, AI systems that also look at the patient record and that advise the doctor about, uh, well, what kind of diagnosis she or he might need to, to take. Uh, maybe another example is uh, this robot that you uh, might have seen before, Paro. Uh, it looks like a seal, but it's actually quite a fancy robot. Uh, also to help uh, keep company uh, for elderly people, um, um, it is warm, it has a heartbeat, it breathes, um, uh, yeah, it, it moves, it makes sounds. It helps especially for people uh, with Alzheimer's disease, people who have lost a lot of their more cognitive uh, elements of their mind, but who are still, well, I mean, yeah, they, they, they feel affection for this animal, if you can call it an animal, and it helps them a lot. Of course, it also raises a lot of worries in society. Is this the path we should take? Is this how we should start to deal with elderly people? And that we let the robots keep them company rather than humans. And I think a better frame is indeed to see this as a cooperation, where there is this interesting new kind of interaction between humans uh, and technologies. And where the, actually, there is not an alterity here, but there is kind of a commonality, you could say. In this case, a nurse and the robot both have a relation with the patient. And what Paro is ultimately doing is not just replacing the family members, replacing the nurse or the doctor. Paro is full of sensors. And Paro um, interacts with the, the person, uh, also measures uh, many things about that person. And with that, Paro can actually tell how somebody is doing. So you could say uh, the human is directed at the world. The AI system is that I'm also doing that. And then there's also an interaction between the human and the AI system. So the intentionality becomes quite complicated here. It's like a triangle. Two elements focusing on the world and also an interaction between these two. So the intentionality can be called a joint intentionality or some kind of a triangular intentionality. 
and which then results in something like a hermeneutic triangle. <laughs> Human interpretations of the world are really doubly affected in interaction with the world itself and interaction with the AI system. But we need to appropriate the AI system in radically new ways. We need to learn to read the intentionality of the AI system. And which is not only about explainability and about transparency, it's also developing a skill. It's, well, learning to know the character of a specific AI system that learns in a specific way, develops in a specific way. And it needs to learn, we need to learn to read the hermeneutic mediations as it were. Paro reconfigures, for instance, how we engage with elderly people. What is relevant? Doctors uh, and patients, the same. How do doctors see, perceive the patients? So um, I think this is a very important step where also that hermeneutic uh, landscape can play an important role. Basically, what it means is that we need to appropriate the technology to understand how the technology gives us an interaction with the world, how the world then becomes meaningful, how the patient is interpreted in a specific way, giving a new role to the technology in that interaction between the doctor and the patient, the nurse and the patient, and also reconstituting that doctor or the patient, that their specific uh, nature that they, that they have. Let's go quickly to the last one, re-embodiment being present at a distance. It's also an example in the field of robotics where AI plays a big role in actually giving us kind of a, a second body. And in hospitals, you see those systems with the telepresence robot being able to walk around as it were, where you can interact with the doctor. A drone, I think is quite a nice other example. And where you operate a drone, the drone perceives the world for you uh, with a robotic body at a distance. So alterity, is not the word to understand the interaction between humans and this kind of AI systems. It's presence at a distance. Where indeed, as I already indicated before, there is this interaction between humans and the controller, between the robot and the world, the drone or the telepresent robot. And of course, you plus the controller have an interaction with the robot plus the world. So there is a triple mediation here, three mediations. How do we interact with the controller? How does the controller give us a representation of the world? Then how does our system communicate with the other system? And how is the drone or the robot interacting with the world? You might have uh, seen all these documentaries, for instance, about um, uh, warfare, military uh, applications of this type of technology, you could say, hey, where actually there's quite a, an important uh, aspect of um, uh, well, moral experience. And I think this again has to do with that flash notion. Again, here there is a chiasm at stake, an interaction between a human being and sometimes another human being or the world through a technology where there is a reciprocity that is at stake somehow. And so uh, perceiving and being perceived now takes place through a robot, actually through two devices, your control unit and the robot. Telepresence means that uh, what happens to your hands, <laughs> to the movements that you can make, gestures. And so this techno flash is actually quite a, well, a poor way of being together. But there is a face, there is sight, there is hearing, there is voice. So there is some kind of reciprocity, but a very specific one. And we need to learn to deal with it. And just as we are learning to deal with this uh, endless <laughs> form of video conferencing now in, uh, in times of the, of the virus. So um, that techno flash needs to be appropriated as well in that hermeneutic landscape. We need to learn to uh, make it our own as it were. And in, in that sense, we well need to learn to work with that second body that we have through telepresence. A drone does the same. And so there are hands, there are eyes, there are ears, there's perception, but there is no face. Uh, of course, uh, in military situations, this is uh, a very uh, nasty situation. Hey, where um, victims of a drone attack do not see, of course, who was doing the attack, but the pilots do. And so uh, there's a lot of interesting research about what happens here ethically and also psychologically, hey, where there's a lot of therapies that simply do not work for the post-traumatic stress symptoms that these soldiers have because of the total disconnection that they feel between looking their victims straight into the eyes and still being somewhere in a totally safe environment. So moral experiences are mediated quite thoroughly here in this context. And so there is three mediations at stake here where the interpretations of humans uh, are mediated uh, in new ways. Yeah? 
which also means that we need to take responsibility for how the world becomes present for us. We need to learn to deal with that. And uh, this has a clear moral dimension and the, the distance and newness, moral distance, moral and newness are mediated here quite explicitly. <clears throat> Now, let's uh, end uh, in just five minutes with the implications for how to do ethics. I've basically tried to focus in my talk on how AI systems challenge the way in which we look at human technology relations and how we need to rethink central notions that are also ethically relevant, like mainly intentionality or agency. What does that mean for ethics? <clears throat> I think you know, often still people in applied ethics still associate ethics with the medical ethical model, eh, where you have to ask permission to do something to an ethical committee, eh, which says uh, yes or no. And I think in the ethics of technology, of course, things are much more complicated because uh, what we've seen so far, there are several ways in which technologies play a role in ethics itself. We cannot only assess technologies ethically, but technologies also affect how we do ethics. And so the standard model, of course, is to evaluate the moral quality of the impact of a technology. That's what we often do. Is it desirable or not that an AI system will advise a doctor? What are the requirements for that? Fair, explainable, transparent, etc. But then one layer deeper, AI systems have an impact on our moral agency. They inform our moral actions, our moral decisions. And the relation between humans and the world is mediated by AI systems in many ways, as I've tried to, to show with all these different forms of intentionality, mediated intentionality. So AI systems help to shape what the world means for us and how we can take responsibility for it. Up to the point, that point three, even our moral frameworks themselves, the meaning of values, the meaning of concepts like agency, responsibility, democracy, these are also um, affected, you could say, by technologies. This means that I think we should work on two tracks in ethics. Of course, we need to theorize this. And that's uh, what we do a lot and what we all like to do a lot. Um, it's super important. There's a second track that we do not give that much attention because it's so applied, but I still feel close to that. Uh, working in the design lab of the University of Twente and having an engineering background myself, I also feel the importance of reaching out to technology itself. <clears throat> and for this, we have developed an approach uh, over the past two years um, which aims to see ethics as a form of guidance, not as assessment, but as a form of accompaniment, you could say. A very practical approach, which I think can help also to raise and to see exactly these ethical issues in point two and three of this slide, how technologies are in our moral agency and how they affect moral frameworks. And so in the approach, what you typically do is to work with people in a practice. It's not only with the ethical experts, but it's, if you introduce an AI system in the hospital, we've done a session in the hospital over here in the Netherlands, over the police. Um, what you do is you have a designer of the system, you have people working with the system, trying to understand if you have an AI system to detect uh, cancer cells in uh, pictures of uh, tissue. How, how does that work? How does the system give advice? How does the doctor work with the system? All these details, that's stage one. Getting in touch with the details of it. And that's maybe also because of my phenomenological background. We want the concreteness of the world, you could say. And then the most important step probably is the step of dialogue. But typically what you do in this workshop setting is to uh, identify all the actors that are involved somehow. Uh, and then see what kind of effects the technology has on these actors or what mediations in my own words. What does the technology do to all those actors from the perspective of all the actors you have identified with as the goal to identify the values that are at stake in these effects. What is at stake? Is it respect for patients? Is it the possibility for doctors to take responsibilities? And there are always a few key values. In such a session, we always try to arrive at the three or four most important values. But then the trick is, not to use these values only as a form of assessment, saying, okay, then we do not want the technology or we do want it, but to see, okay, if we want to keep up these values, how can we use them to, uh, well, redesign the device itself, the software itself, the algorithm itself? How can the technology uh, embody these values? So this is uh, ethics by design, you could say. 
how can the environment be changed? How can we implement the technology in a responsible way in our society? And how can we equip the user in a specific way to be able to take responsibility for the technology? So this is a totally different type of ethics, you could say. It's an ethics from inside, from within, not from outside. It tries to stand next to the technology to understand how it affects the, the world and how we can take responsibility for it. And so you accompany it and not assess it from outside. It's also, Positive ethics, you could say, not negative, not meaning that it's positive about any technology, of course not. I think it's a way also to be very yeah, somewhat critical, but it means it doesn't only look for um, the negative things that you want to keep out, but it tries to identify the conditions for what is positive, what we do want. So that's the focus on values. And maybe most importantly, it is bottom up, not top down. It's not only the experts deriving ethics from the books, but it's actually getting in touch with citizens, stakeholders. And that's where you can see the impact. That's where you can follow how we need to expand the frameworks that we have in ethics. So this was uh, quite a, a long tour maybe through all kinds of elements of that complicated interaction between technologies and humans, and especially how technologies make us think in a new way, how our mind is at stake. And I hope that this will somehow be a broad inspiration for the fascinating discussion that we will have over the coming days. Thank you very much.